All right, y'all, we're on the road. Look at Alexia's driving. Immaculate. You sound so excited. Look we're at this outfit. Immaculate. Another venture to promote redress. You almost said it wrong. I heard that. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Judging. We're already judging. It's not even 10 in the morning. It's not American Idol. Not even 10 in the morning, and he's already. That's right. So, it's not even 10 in the morning, and we're already going to Duncan. Again. What is. What do you mean again? You know what I mean. What is wrong with Duncan? Like well, she, there's a lot wrong with Duncan. She but. got the Duncan app and everything, y'all. Yo. Duncan should have promoted us because I stay promoting them. Seriously. Sponsor us. Anyway, we're on our way to Connecticut. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I'm here again. <laughs> they recognize my car. They like, know her by name, guys. They like pull up. <laughs> what can I get for you? I have a mobile order for Alexia. Thank you. See, they already know by name. She just gotta drop the name and they know. Anyway, we're going to Connecticut um, for another promotion of Redress, Chris's anime he made in college. Animation. Animation, sorry. There's a difference, I know. You're yeah, right, yeah. yeah. I am. That's like a three hour drive. We're gonna meet up with his friend. It's freezing. This jacket is not warm enough for what we're doing, but. Yeah, and we have to walk to Connecticut, actually. Luckily, they didn't know that until now. You're kind of like. A horrible dad jokester. Like it's. Uh, you're kind of like. You're kind of like. It's not. You're like, kind of like too serious. It's literally not. You kind of need like, to it's like. It's not even chill about serious. Out. You're like. Hey, you know what? Like that's not you, even. You know what, guys? I hope like, this drink that she funny, gets. It's funny, but it's not. Cools, cools her out. <laughs> Hopefully, this drink chills you out. What kind of drink? Is did that you another get? dad joke? No. Like, what kind of you drink? You got did an iced coffee. I hope it cools you down. Like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This vlog is not about Duncan. Can you like get over yourself and talk about? Leo, how can it's not about Duncan? And we're literally. At Duncan. Yeah, but we're not gonna be here for. Look at us, mom. She's so happy when we talk about Duncan. What is wrong with so you? So happy. All right. Anyways, so yeah, we're going to Connecticut. Uh, gonna be screening my film at the Milford Arts Council at a World of Wonders. It's at 7 p.m. Uh, it's gonna be Q and A afterwards. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You know. I know. It's not like I'm driving or anything. Yeah, you know. Go but, ahead uh, with the facts. We're gonna be uh, going there to Connecticut, meeting with my friend Raheem. You guys have met him before. He's been on the podcast, and uh, yeah, it should be a nice event. You know, do some networking, Q and A with the audience. So it should be fun. You know, we have a three-hour drive ahead of us, and we're gonna vlog the whole thing. Please help. Did you get an energy drink? No. Oh, okay. All right. Energy drinks are horrible. I was gonna say. Oh. Kind of don't need that it. That car in front of us almost hit the ball. Look, look. You're not even recording it. You have a camera <laughs> roll, rolling, and you're like recording me. Sorry, I was like. I do have to say, <laughs> since um, our our follower followers know that I can't do makeup, <laughs> so I'm just like. <laughs> makeup looks fine. Yeah, I I have to check. All right, relax. You could have just asked. Why? So you could give me some dad joke. I'm stupid. No, I waited to give you a you know, yeah, but genuine that, compliment. Oh, it looks fine. No. Okay, that, you look crazy right now. <laughs> oh, it looks fine. Oh, oh, fine. No, it looks good. Oh, it looks good. It looks natural, yeah. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. All right. That's it's not too much. It's not overdone, you know? It's very minimal. Yeah, good, because that's because I don't know how to do it. Crazy. So let's get out of this godforsaken state. <laughs> Think we have arrived? I hope so. Oh, Alexia, I hope so. She's <laughs> she's beat. You know. I'm dead. That um driving hypnosis, that shit's real. That shit's real. What you just kind of got like lost in it? No, you know, like when you zone out and then you're like, oh, I'm still awake, but I'm following all like the laws on the road. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> That's reassuring. That's real. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on in here? Should I bring everything? No, I think that's good for now. My trash? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, the crows know Alexia's here. The crows come to greet us. It's Raheem. 
<laughs> Reunited. So back on the trip, guys. What's up, Raheem? How you doing? Good, how are you? It's very cool. You're, aren't you at home on the stage? I feel more comfortable. You wanna spit some shit? Nah, I don't wanna spit no shit. Aren't you a rapper? Can you rap for me? <laughs> Give me some wrapping paper and I'll wrap you a gift. We're gonna grab some lunch with Raheem now. Where are we going? Founder's house. It's near uh, the, the Mac. What they serve? Food. Good food. Okay. All Ooh. Right. Nothing like to he said it's a really cute it's speakeasy, like so I'm excited to see because you know how they like decorate it with like string lights and like plants, and there's probably gonna be really cool furniture in there. Yeah. Are you good? Like, we're here for your event. That sun is like right in my eye. Yeah, but we're here for your event, and you're just like, okay. <laughs> Raheem is the event coordinator. He said that um, the rest of the week was actually really packed. So should be a good turnout tonight. Really excited. We're gonna take a little break, get some food, and then we'll be right back to the gallery. Meanwhile, Raheem and I were setting up. More people are coming. Hello. Oh, hello. We got people coming. And then, almost all set up. We're about to get Chris's movie playing. We're going to talk to some people, meet and greet, and then there's going to be a Q&A after. Are you nervous? A little bit. <laughs> I think I'll get over it, though. A lot of different things. He's a hip-hop artist. He's a screenwriter, a filmmaker, a graphic designer. He does a lot of many different things well. Just an artist. Yeah, just an artist. All the things that come with that. And we we're going to be screening his thesis film, Redress. And I remember when you were telling me about it, uh, just how everything was coming together and just how much work, uh, how much fortitude it took for you to complete a film where even, you know, people in your grade level and, you know, your teachers were like, oh, wow, this is like too much. So I remember seeing the photos from, you know, uh, the SVA theater, you know, where it was screened. And just how really it was historic because nobody has done had done a film like that, especially in uh, their thesis year. Like you were a student, you were working, you were going to school, like you were just doing a lot of different things. Yeah. So the fact that this film could come out the way that it did with everything you were dealing with, like it's just a testament to your creativity, I think. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I guess I kind of give more context to that. When I was uh, at SVA, they strongly advised only doing a film no longer than three minutes and to kind of give context for animation animation how it usually works is 24 frames per second of film that you're seeing so it's basically 24 drawings for every second that you're seeing on screen and uh my film is 11 minutes <laughs> <laughs> fully voice acted scored colored shaded directed by me um my goal with the film was to create a movie that when you're watching it, you forget that you're watching an animation and you just basically get lost in the story that's trying to be told. So because I knew I was trying to do something overly ambitious, I actually started working on the film the year before my senior year. To start prepping, getting the actors, recording their lines, doing all the backgrounds and keyframes, and then in my final year, just sort of animating, coloring, and cleaning. The whole film itself is 7,643 drawings. Jeez. Yeah, it took me two and a half years to do it from conception to completion. So I appreciate you guys coming out here in the cold to check it out. Um, the film took a lot out of me, I'm not gonna lie, but I believe if you're gonna do something, do it well, because at the end of the day, like it could transcend the time in which you made it and you know, I've been lucky and blessed that this film has legs that still to this day people want to see it and enjoy it. So that's what I'm here to share with you guys. Um, Redress is a revenge story, um, but also an origin story told through the lives of other characters. And it's basically talking about how revenge is a disease and it bleeds and infects anybody that's around it, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally.
really forgiveness isn't for your other people, but it's for yourself. And but I think a lot of times that's the hardest thing to do because we're flawed as human beings, so we want to right a wrong that is being done to us. And that's actually what the name of the means. It's an endless cycle that will keep on going unless somebody decides to put it down. What was the reception like after you screened it at SBA? While I was in college, a lot of people, well, some of the students, I guess, kind of saw me as like arrogant. They're like, oh, he thinks he's going to have like the best film because he's going to do something that's four times the amount of what we're supposed to be doing. And because of that, I guess people didn't expect it to be good. So when it played in the theater, I remember a lot of people like coming up to me like, oh man, like they were just honest. Like I didn't think it was going to be any good, and then like. You proved me wrong, and I just the scene where the son gets shot in the head. Yeah, I just remember watching that in the theater, and like everybody went silent, and they and they didn't know what to do to get like the pin drop. And then when the revelation came of who it was, everyone was kind of like, "Oh my God!" It's like you know, kind of crazy. And I remember a lot of my professors came up to me afterwards and were like, "Wow, like you you're really good. Like you got it. Like you should make movies." And then the student who won best film the year prior. She came up to me and told me I had the best film of the year, which meant a lot to me to kind of hear that from the person who won the award the year before. So it was kind of nice. So, yeah, that was a little bit of the reception. As far as the making of the film, uh, how I kind of wanted to do it, how it originally I came up with the idea for it was the woman that you see at the end with the green eyes. I originally wanted to create a story about her. But I didn't want to do something so typical that was boring, just like an origin story, like this is what happens to them and then you just follow it. So I just said to myself, for myself as a viewer and someone who loves film, like how could I make that interesting? And I said, well, what if I was able to tell you the origin story of the character through the lives of other people? You just didn't know it's about them the entire time because you're entrenched in these people's lives, like what's going on with them? You follow them, what's going on with Alex Thompson, Samuel, his mother, Jewel Spice are not realizing there's an innocent bystander that kind of got affected by this whole circle of revenge, as he put it. So that was really the antithesis of the idea for it. And I rewrote the script, I think, 37 times before I came down to the version that I had. So, yeah, even now, the, the movie as it is right now, I had to make some edits and cuts because the scene where Alex Thompson comes home and he finds his wife with Jewel Spicer, that was supposed to be expanded upon. But around that time, my grandfather had passed away. So I had to go and attend to that. So I had to find a way to kind of edit the scene and still make it read as to what was going on, even though like a big chunk of it was gonna go missing. So there are like little parts where you see her hand and his hand goes over hers. He's wearing a wedding, a wedding ring. Because what's supposed to happen is when Alex Thompson walks into the room, the goon that he sees in the prison to kind of get the information hits him in the back of the head. And Alex Thompson is on the ground the entire time. So when this happens, Jewel Spicer comes up, steps on his hand, and removes his right wing and puts it on himself and then proceeds to torture him by raping his wife in front of him, you know, after he puts on the ring and says, till death do his part. And then he kills his wife in front of him. But I kind of had to cut all that and I wanted to make it as tasteful as possible because I didn't want to just explicitly show rape like that but I just thought to myself if someone's going to hold a vendetta for 25 years it has to be something pretty substantial it can't just be like it took my parking spot you know so I kind of thought to myself what, what would I do in that situation I probably want to kill somebody if they went that far to hurt me so music by Nate Feenan uh, Finnan, yes. Finnan. Um, so do you, or did you work with that as far as finding the music, editing, do you rely on him to do that? With animation, usually the film is done before you actually start animating the film. So you kind of have to have your sound, your audio, your dialogue already recorded and pre-planned out in your storyboard. So when it came to the music, I was working with me with that and around the time I think Inception had just come out mm -hmm. and I went to the theater to go see that movie and 
if anybody has seen that film, when you go in there, the music plays a very big part in that movie. And I remember just walking out the theater and I just, I really love what Christopher Nolan is able to do uh, with his film, with Hans Zimmerman, who does the, compose those movies, like The Dark Knight and everything. And I just remember like leaving out, like, it kind of gives you a feel of an atmosphere. So music tells your audience how they should be feeling. You could change the whole dynamic of the scene if you remove the music and I start playing uh, the last track behind it, you know, it changes the whole dynamic. So I had music in my mind that I wanted it to be similar to, but I didn't want to copy it. And I got really lucky finding him because this was during the time of Craigslist was like the go-to place. So I uh, searched for a song composer to make the score for the film and he offered to do it for me for free. And he was actually the composer for the show, The Blacklist, that stars uh, James Spader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he did the music for that show and he did the music for my film. So once he showed me his first rendition and I sent him the timing of the animation so this way we knew what beats we needed to hit. And I was like, okay, I need this mark to hit here and I need it to hit here and I want this to hit here to meet with this transition, but also kind of give you this feeling. So that's kind of how he and I work. So I locked him in and I was already about halfway through with the film. So I was able to give him like clips of it that weren't fully animated or colored, but still follow like the beats and the pacing of the story at that time. When did you graduate from SVA and have you done any filmmaking since then or other projects? Okay, so I graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 2011. And I have worked on other animation uh, shorts as well, uh, cartoons. I did Jasper and Smiley. I also worked on a couple, a couple projects for Marvel, uh, being an in-betweener. But with this project, what I came to learn, my dream was always to kind of be an animator. Well, I guess like to be more honest and transparent, I grew up in the 90s, so I don't know if anyone is familiar with Dragon Ball Z, but um, Dragon Ball Z is kind of like a show I, a show I grew up with. So I always told myself, like, oh, like that would be a dream job to like work on that show, to like animate at least a scene from it. But once I actually got into doing animation myself and I realized how much work went into it, I was like, okay, like I don't really enjoy the process but I have complete respect and admiration for the process that does go into it, being that I did every step of the process. And since then, I've wanted to still work on films and make movies, so I've written scripts um, for short films and stories that I wanted to tell, whether it be animation or live action. Like As far as this story, when I wrote it, it was a trilogy, so there was two other installments that were going to come after. The second film takes place direct, directly right after this movie. So with the crime scene, with the son getting shot in the head, the movie opens up with uh, the police at the hospital trying to investigate the crime scene and find the connections on what's going on. And they're able to tie everybody together. Like they realize that the kid that shot on the ground is related to the dead man down the hall. And the dead man down the hall had a previous altercation with the guy that's in the room with the son shot in the head who has his throat slice. So they're able to connect those dots, but no one knows who shot the kid in the head. So then the film would kind of transition to the bullet hole from the window, going to the top of the building where you see the shell of the bullet still left behind. And then it goes back 25 years to the scene where you see Alex Thompson kill her family. And she runs out that doorway to basically follow him. And she ends up getting lost. She's a little girl. I think she's five years old at the time. And when she just tries to go back home, everything's already taped off. The cops are there, neighbors are called, the police, and she gets scared. So she stays outside. And they never find this little girl. So I think maybe two weeks go by, and she's hiding out behind this restaurant, behind the dumpster, like to kind of like find shelter. And these little kids are basically messing with her. At this time, it takes uh, the story takes place around the time of the Vietnam War. So there's a female sniper who comes back home from Vietnam, and she's on leave back in her area 
and she's at this restaurant that she usually goes to, she grew up here. So as she's at this restaurant, she notices the little girl getting picked on. So she goes to go help the little girl and get the boys away from her. She brings her inside, gets her some food, and tries to get to know her and talk to her. But the little girl doesn't really tell her anything. She's just very quiet and keeps to herself. So this lady, she kind of grows an attachment to her and brings her to her house with her. And it's really the story of two broken people who are leaning on each other to kind of help mend the pieces that they are missing. Because I want to do something else a bit more interesting. So you have this girl who comes from her family being murdered, and then this lady who is unable to have children. So she kind of adopts this little girl as a surrogate child without ever knowing her name or her history. And she grows up because she's a sniper. The gun that you see at the end of the film, that's the gun that she's holding. The reason why she's bald and she cuts her hair is because when she was teaching her to snipe and she would focus on the sights, she used to have her hair, so she would tell her you need to clear the bangs, female line of sights this way you can get a better shot. And she just kind of took it to the next extreme and just shaved her whole head off. And she goes, all right, you kind of took what I said to the extreme, but that'll work too. And what ends up happening, she gets called back out to serve in the military. And because uh, Asasa's name of the ball girl is her next of kin, she receives a letter at the house saying that she was killed in action. So that, fe that feeling of her losing this person who she saw as a mother kind of reignites this revenge that she had for Alex Thompson killing her family because she was able to let it go. So she thought she found peace by having that news of her being killed kind of brings her back to this place and now she's looking for a target in order to focus her anger and emotions back. So that's the second one. You know, hopefully next time I do it, I'm gonna have a team. I don't wanna do it by myself. Yeah. Kind of drove myself crazy. When I made this film, I was only able to sleep about three hours at a time, most. So I struggled. Once I finished the film, I was like, I cherished my sleep from that moment on. Can you touch on what you do in music and how it relates to storytelling and animation? Oh man. Just um, touch on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I come from an art background, I actually didn't write music first. I used to draw first, but I've always been intrigued with stories that I just feel still like in the world, I still think like the greatest magic trick, if you want to call it a magic trick, is stories. People love stories. So when I do that, I also do that with my music. I kind of if I'm writing verses, I kind of see like the beginning, middle, and end, and there's a progression. So I kind of use that to translate to my films and vice versa. But even with my music, I guess I also use that as well to kind of create films because I could do music videos, but they're a lot shorter and I can get a lot more people involved, but still kind of it's that creative love that I have. Because we use art to decorate space, but music to decorate time. <laughs> yeah, like I, I've always been a fan of that. It's like part of movies that have a twist but make sense. It's to kind of reward your audience for paying attention to the little things. So even as you see how the movie starts, it starts, the first shot is Misasa, and then the last shirt, the last shot is her as well. You know, so the quote in the beginning of the film is the quote that she says at the end of the film. So kind of bring it in full circle. You did a good job of only drawing or introducing characters that you used, but it also didn't seem empty. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I tried to make it seem like a lifted world. Yeah. The original version of the movie started with Nasasa sitting at a diner across from the man who killed her family. And it was very like Quentin Tarantino-esque, where it was like very dialogue heavy. And then you find out at the end of the movie that the guy she's been talking to the entire time is dead. And I'm just like, yeah, that's kind of dumb. Like, why would you talk to a dead person? You know, like, for the sake of the movie, like, why would you narrate that? So I had a friend that kind of told me, yeah, you have to change that. Like, it's cool what you're trying to vote for, but it doesn't really work. So, you know, it's actually going to be, like, a bit more, like, a generation, like, further in. And it kind of just was overcomplicating the story at that point. I was being a little too ambitious. The very important part to me, which I'm happy worked, was the emotional resonance of the film and the twist when it did get shot. I was like, all right, like, if anything, if nothing else works, this has to work. You know, so I knew that was going to be like a scene. I was like, all right, I gotta 
I had a nail in that. So once you kind of have these things in place, it's kind of like you start from there and then you start to build and then it becomes like bigger. Instead of looking at it as huge snaps, it becomes overwhelming. So you just break it down into smaller chunks. How do you go about um, developing your style or your voice for storytelling? Was it like something that you always had a knack for or did you like develop your voice over time? I think I've kind of always had a knack for it. I've always been engaged in very interesting stories. And I don't know, it just seems like pretty natural to me to do so. Even when I was young, like it was really bad. But basically made my own like knockoff version of like Dragon Ball scene because I was obsessed with the show. But I wrote it and I had all these plans and I just kind of always follow it. Even when, like I said, when I do my music, it's the same thing. It's like I find the most interesting place to start from and then build from that and make the story as interesting as possible. Because I try to take myself out of my shoes as a creator and put myself in the shoes of the listener or the viewer. I'm like, what would I like to see? What would I like to watch? You know, and they always say great artists create and they'll create what they want to see in the world. So that's kind of my approach when I'm creating any type of art. What about um, the character designs, Chris? Like how did that come about? And how intentional were you? And like even like what the characters were wearing mm. as opposed to what they actually did in the story. Okay, um, Nisasa was actually, <laughs> this is funny. Is anybody here familiar with the Rush Hour series with Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan? Mm. Yeah? All right, so in Rush Hour 3, there's a French character <clears throat> and she has like a tattoo on the back of her head. But that they're looking for this kind of like scroll or scripture in order to find this MacGuffin that's in the film. And they don't realize that she has it, that's a tattoo because she's wearing the wig. So there's a scene where she takes the wig off and she's bald. She has green eyes, she has tan skin like myself, and she's wearing a long trench coat. And she's, there was just one shot where she has these two guns that she's pointing one at Chris Tucker and one at Jackie Chan. And that shot, I was like, that is a really cool looking character. And I just thought to myself, I'm like, what would get my attention in real life? You know, if an anime everyone has these crazy hairstyles and colors, and I thought, okay, maybe less is more. And I just said to myself, okay, well, if I saw a woman who was about five foot nine, six foot, bald, green eyes, I think that would get anybody's attention. So I worked from that. And that's why she was always the first character that I was the most interested in. Then as I continued to develop the story, I basically tried to create the characters based on what the story required. So Alex Thompson, I kind of wanted him to seem very just down to earth, not flamboyant. Jewel Spicer, I especially drew a inspiration from the Joker. I think the Joker is such an iconic villain. So I kind of wanted him to kind of have this evil look, but also flamboyant. So that's why he's wearing the white shirt, uh, the red kind of also a, a knot, the Scarface. Um, Lola, the name of the wife, that's also a nod to the Copacabana, if you hear the song, the story in that song. So there's that. And then Alex Thompson, uh, Samuel Thompson, who's the son, I wanted to keep him as simple and as modern as possible. So that's why I kind of just gave him a hoodie with a jacket over it and some boots, and I tried to give him a very clean cut, minimalistic look. It was difficult, though. I think Alex Thompson was the hardest one because I had to play with different times. I had to play with him being young when he was in his 30s and then again him being like in his 60s. And I was like, all right, well, how do I age his character but still not change him too much but he's like unrecognizable. So appreciate you guys you know, taking time to be here with me and watching my film. So thank you very much. Let's give you guys a round of applause. <laughs> I also want to thank Raheem for inviting me as a guest and allowing me to show my film and share it with a new audience. So I really appreciate that, Raheem. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Pretty satisfied, successful event. Thanks again to Raheem. Shout out to Raheem and shout out to the Mac Firehouse Gallery for hosting us in this awesome event. Full video uh, later. If you guys have any other questions that weren't asked during the session, you can ask CEO in the comments below. I will answer on his behalf, but obviously from him. I'm not going to answer for him, Great. just so he knows. I'm here, guys, so you can ask me the questions as well. 
and Alexia. And yeah, I definitely want to say thank you once again to my longtime friend Raheem for hosting the event, for allowing me to screen the film. Yes. Also the Firehouse Gallery for allowing us to screen the film here. Thank you, Connecticut. And thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, like, and comment. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Lexia Lou and of course TikTok at Alexia. And you can find all of Chris's socials on thisisceo.com. Bye. And join us on the struggle bus. <laughs>